Hello all, hope you're all doing well and adjusting to this new norm that we have here. It's certainly different for me and I'm sure most of you that haven't had online classes before. Um, but teaching and learning is a little bit different in this venue. Uh, it's hard for me not seeing your faces to know whether you're understanding things or not, but I trust that you will contact me uh, through Canvas or through Gmail if there's something that uh, that you're not getting so that I can explain it a little bit more so that uh, hopefully that you will get it. Just make time daily to study so that you're prepared for the quizzes when they show up. All right, having said all of that, let's start with chapter 12, Geologic Structures. This chapter is all about folds, faults, and joints. Think of these things as the foundation, the underpinning, or the skeletal framework upon which mountains, valleys, basins, ranges, and all manner of things are formed. The structure, the skeleton of Earth, if you will. There's a handout posted under the modules that's a guide for organizing some of the concepts in this chapter, and I hope you'll, you'll look at it. So first we start with our three types of plate boundaries, divergent, convergent, and transform. Earth's rocks are stressed by the forces at work at these plate boundaries, and those stresses can be felt hundreds of miles away. Well, what are those stresses? At a divergent plate boundary, the major force at work is tension. Tension is where the Earth's crust is being pulled apart. It's being stretched. So we looked at Iceland, we looked at the basin and range, we looked at mid-ocean ridges, the Red Sea, the Atlantic Ocean. All of these are divergent plate boundaries and they're being pulled apart. At a convergent plate boundary, the major uh, stress at work is compression. Compression is the squeezing of Earth's crust. And at transform plate boundaries, the major stress at work is shear. Shear is where rocks slide past each other. And they can slide past each other going different directions. They can slide past each other going the same direction, just at different speeds. So then the next question is, how do rocks behave when they're subjected to these stresses? And the answer to that can be a little complicated because it depends on where the rocks are located. Are they at the surface or are they at depth? How long have they been subjected to these stresses? Short time, long time? What type of rock is it? Some rocks are stronger than other rocks. How much water is present? So there's a variety of factors that come into play. So just to simplify things, let's just think rocks at depth where we know they're gonna be warmer and more malleable, and at the surface where they're cool and they're brittle. So there are three ways that rocks can behave. Rocks can be ductile or malleable. Rocks can be elastic, meaning that they will be stretched and deformed, but when that force is removed, the rocks will return to their original shape. Or rocks can be brittle. The other factor to think about is what sort of deformation or strain will result. And there are three major types of deformation. There are faults, there are folds, and there are joints. The faults are breaks in the rock, and there are different types that will result depending on whether the rocks have been placed under tension, compression, or shear. Rocks can be folded only at depth. They have to be malleable, they have to be ductile, and the force at work would be compression. So we're gonna talk about all of these structures, folds, faults, and joints, how they form, how we define them uh, in the, the next section of, of this chapter. So let's just take a gander here at the learning objectives. So uh, we need to define the three types of stress and apply them to plate boundaries, and that's just what I talked about. Distinguish between elastic, brittle, 
and ductile deformation. Sometimes ductile deformation is also called plastic deformation. Explain how factors like confining pressure, temperature, and strain will affect the amount of deformation that rocks undergo. And then be able to compare and contrast folds, faults, and joints. Compare and contrast strike slip faults and dip slip faults. Those are normal and reverse faults. Define and describe anticlines, synclines, and other types of folds. Compare and contrast volcanic mountains, fault block mountains, and fold and thrust mountains. And know what strike and dip is. Now, I don't expect you to uh, be out there in the field uh, measuring strike and dip with rocks, but I do expect you to know that, that structural geologists do this and just have uh, some general knowledge of how it works. And then describe the types of information that are depicted on a geologic map. So things are a little slow here on my computer today. All right, so structural geology, this is what we're talking about, the structure. What is the structure of the earth? And it's a branch of geology that studies stress and strain. What are these stresses? What are these forces at work on rocks? And how do the rocks respond to those forces? So stress will create strain. What are the processes that cause these stresses? And what's the deformation? What are the rock structures that will result from, uh, from these stresses? And the best place to study structure is in a mountain range. Uh, if you can actually, the other good place to study structure is road cuts. Road cuts are pretty great. Quarries are pretty great. That's why geologists are attracted to these places because you get to see the guts of the earth. Otherwise, we're just up here on the surface, oblivious to what is going on underneath our feet. So if we, have, if we see a road cut and we see the rocks in that road cut, then we're looking at the structure of the earth. How does that structure support what we see at the surface? So when we think about the forces that are going on at plate boundaries, um, which we talked about earlier, what kind of plate boundary do you think would produce mountains like you see here? Oh, wait a second. Hopefully you see that these aren't volcanoes. These are high mountains, they're rugged mountains. So at what type of plate boundary do you think a mountain range like that would form? And if you said at a convergent plate boundary where two continental plates are colliding, you would be correct. The, the other two types of convergent plate boundaries, ocean, ocean, and ocean continent, we're going to have volcanoes. And volcanoes aren't held, are mountains that aren't held together very well at all. They're rotten, as I occasionally say. Um, so they're easy to move, that mass wasting, weathering, and erosion. Mountains that have been crumpled, that have formed from the crumpling of these, these continental plates against each other are normally stronger, stronger rocks. And then what you're looking at here are some folds. Actually, you see two things here. We're looking at folds. And why do you think they're called folds? Because the rocks are folded up. Well, you know the only place that that is going to happen is at depth, where as we get deeper, it gets warmer, the rocks warm up, and they're more malleable. They're not melted. If they were melted, we wouldn't see these folds, but they're kind of like silly putty. And when compression, when compressional forces are at work, we get these folds. And of course, uh, the different parts of the fold have names and we'll get into that. But the other thing that you see here is a fault. So these rocks have been shoved over these rocks right here. There's the break, there's the fault line. So plate movement at work. All right, so types of crustal stress then. Stress is any applied force which causes rocks to undergo 
strain, and that strain is any change in the shape or the volume of the rock. And the three types are compression, where the rocks are squeezed. That happens at convergent plate boundaries, where we have these squeezing forces at work. And it will result in shortening strain. The length of the rocks will be shortened. They might increase in height, but the overall length will, uh, uh, will shorten. It's just like taking a scatter rug and wrinkling it up, or an accordion. If you put the accordion together, you can press the accordion. The length of that accordion shortens. Uh, tension is when rocks are pulled apart. And when you stretch rocks, they're going to extend. They're going to increase in length. Remember uh, Nevada, the entire state of Nevada. If we could push that accordion back together again, Nevada would be 100 miles shorter than it is now. So tensional forces have stretched it apart. And then shear, the rocks are moved parallel to one another. Uh, and again, they can be going same direction or different direction. They're shearing past each other. The strain is parallel to the direction of stress. And a good example of this is the San Andreas Fault and all the other hundreds of faults that are associated with the San Andreas Fault. Those are shearing forces. Those are shearing stresses that are happening there. So this, um, this little cartoon right here shows you undeformed sedimentary rock layers up here. Nothing has happened. We have flat line sedimentary rocks. And then let's see what happens when we stretch those rocks when we have these tensional forces at work as we would at a divergent plate boundary. Well, let's think of Nevada. This is how Nevada formed. We have these tensional forces, so rocks at the surface will break, and they break into what we call these normal faults. Don't worry about that right now. We'll talk about how normal faults and reverse faults work uh, in a bit. So the crust is breaking apart. Uh, so we have one chunk of crust that drops down in relation to another uh, chunk of crust. Okay, that's tension. What about compression? Look what happens when we compress. These rocks fold up, but they're only going to do that at depth. Think of what would happen if those rocks at the surface are compressed. Rocks are cold at the surface. They're brittle at the surface. So if that, if that force that, that is at play is stronger than the rock can handle, then the rock will break. But at depth, those compressional forces will cause these beautiful folds in rocks. At the surface, compressional forces will cause a type of fault called a reverse fault. And then here's the shear stress at work. The rocks slide past each other, that shearing force side by side. So those are the, our three major types of stress then. So these rocks are undeformed rocks. These rocks haven't undergone any type of stress. What is your clue to that? You might be thinking, well, those certainly look like something has happened to them. And yeah, something has happened to them. They've been weathered and eroded. But if you if you check out the lines in here, the layers in here, there's no displacement in here at all. There might be missing uh, parts of the rock because of the weathering and erosion, but that line just goes, those lines, those layers just go straight across. So they haven't been deformed in any way. And we see that in the Grand Canyon these layers of rocks that we can just track those layers over miles and miles and miles. So they haven't been deformed in any way. Here's a good example right here. You don't see any folds or faults. Uh, you might see some, um, some joints, some fractures in here. And then what about this rock? Do you think there's anything that's happened to that rock? Yes, I hope your answer is yes, because that rock didn't form that way. When those sediments were laid down, they were laid down horizontally. So when we see tilted rocks like this, we know that there was some force at work that caused those rocks to tilt. So what we actually have here is a fold 
This rock was folded at depth, but now through tectonic uplift, weathering and erosion, it's made it to the surface. So this is what it really looked like. Grab a little pen here. It really looked like that. So all we're seeing is this part over here, these layers over here. Uh, and you see that um, the layers of rock underneath here are more erodible. They're weathering away. What happens when you have a harder rock on top of a softer rock that is disappearing? Well, at some point, those rocks are going to start falling too. So we're seeing just one limb of an anticline. These limbs over here, oops, this always happens to me. These limbs over here on this side, they've been weathered away. So tilted rocks, those are deformed rocks. So a strain then is the change in shape and or volume of a rock caused by stress. And strain takes place in three stages. Elastic deformation. Uh, when um, oh, we talked about earthquakes, uh, remember what the theory behind how earthquakes occur? Elastic. Elastic. Um, uh, strain is taking place, so the rocks are stretched, the elastic rebound theory. Uh, so the rocks are being stretched and um, they're deforming as they're being stretched. The, but as they're stretched past their limit to handle it, then that's when the, the, the fault moves. And the rocks can return to their original shape because they have been heated through friction as they're moving past each other, they get heated up, they become stretchy like a rubber band. But then when that force, all those, that energy is released, the rocks can return to their original shape. So that's elastic deformation. Ductile deformation happens when the rocks are stretched past their, their strength and they deform and when the stress is removed, they will stay deformed. So a folded rock would be an example of ductile form, uh, deformation. And fracture then, that happens when a rock at the surface is stretched past its limit, stressed past its limit, and it will break, it will fracture. Now the difference between a fracture, the other term for fracture is joint, the difference between a fracture and a fault is both of them are cracks in the Earth's crust, but a fracture, there's been no movement. A, uh, a fault, there has been movement. Okay, so this uh, shows you what we're dealing with here. If this is the stress over here on the vertical scale, I'm gonna grab a laser pointer. If this is stress being plotted on the vertical scale, this is strain or deformation being plotted on the horizontal scale. And we see, and in this region right here, this is where we would have elastic deformation. And that is, that can be fully reversible. So there would be no deformation when the stress is removed. In the B range right here, right here, that's ductile deformation. It's beyond the elastic limit. So the rocks have been stressed past their elastic limit and then that's gonna be irreversible. That strain will be forever until the rock is eroded away or something. And then the C up here, the greater the stress, the greater the deformation, um, the rock will fracture, it will break and that happens in brittle rocks. You're not going to have breakages occur in ductile rocks. Maybe after, after the fact, when they are um, stressed past their limit, they will move against each other, but at the time that they are being formed uh, ductally, uh, they're not going to fracture. So this is what we're talking about. This is nice metamorphic nice rock, G-N-E-I-S-S, -S, and this illustrates ductile strain. So what is the force at work here? Compression. Compression causes these, uh, these uh, different uh, mi minerals, mineral veins in the rock to fold.
So types of strain can depend on the temperature of the rock, the confining pressure, what's the rate of strain, did it happen suddenly? Usually when rocks are strained suddenly, um, there's breakage that takes place. Presence of water and the composition of rock, all these things come into play as to the type of deformation that can take place. This is a fold and you can see that there is a lot of compression going on here because this fold has been overturned. So strain in the crust will produce joints, faults, and folds. So I'm gonna stop here. I want you to think about that and then I'll pick up with this uh, with you next time. Bye-bye.